Okay. All right. So thank you all for coming to today's mini lecture or pocket lecture. We're going to start with Michelle, who's going to do a quick presentation on getting autographs and memorabilia from celebrities and athletes. And then we're going to bounce it over to Maria, who's going to do a compare and contrast of the book and movie versions of The Shining. Um, and again, we will record this and post it to the YouTube page so you can watch it later and for anyone who wasn't able to make it during the lunch hour. So with that, I'll hand it over to Michelle. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm Michelle and I'm um, just going to talk a little bit to, uh, today about autographs and memorabilia, although it kind of will expand a little from there, not just uh, signatures. But um, I'm not a huge, you know, person that goes gaga over celebrities or athletes, but, you know, there's definitely ones I appreciate. I like to have fun. So in the time I've gone and have a lot of, uh, had a lot of experiences in my life and had an opportunity to come across things. Um, in my house, mostly due to my dad over the years, purchased a lot of baseball um, memorabilia signatures. And while those are great and... Um, they're, you know, they have a lot of, I mean, I have Ted Williams, Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle, all of those guys. They were all purchased and they come with certifications and they prove that those items were signed by those people. And that's awesome. And monetarily, you know, they're high in value. But to me, they don't mean as much as what I've collected over the years. That's just some interesting things from people. Um, uh, such here, I have the, uh, uh, my, actually my yearbook picture on the golf team. And uh, that's Janet Reno's signature there with that uh, language. So those are really the ones that mean the most to me. Um, so experiences, that's the first way I've just gotten to do things. I've, you know, I look over the years, you just kind of what's coming around, um, what can you do? A lot of things out there are free. The picture of me at the bottom left, is quite a while ago, but that is me with Dot Richardson. She's an Olympic softball player, and that's a gold medal uh, for the U.S. Olympic team in 96 Olympics for the softball win. And that was a women in sports event, and it was just highlighting different things. It was great. I got Dot's signature. I got to, you know, talk to her a bit. It was very encouraging and just, just an awesome opportunity. Um, the top right, and like, most of these are pictures of pictures, so they look horrible, but yeah, that's Conan O'Brien. And a, one thing you can also do, a lot of shows like Conan O'Brien, any of those SNL, all those things are free. You just need to request tickets in advance. Uh, the only, uh, at the time I was living in New York for most of these, so that made it easier. But I also, another piece is always arrive early because that definitely gets you the, the opportunity to sit right up front, see everyone, and they'll pay more attention to you at Conan O'Brien show. I've gotten things like cue cards. Uh, Mary Lou Retton had been a guest on his show, so I, I got the book she had brought to promote at the time. I've gotten sticks from Max, uh, drumsticks from Max Weinberg, from the, the drummer from his band. So there's lots of fun things like that you could take away. Um, this goes back to a bit, but um, this is when I was younger and still holds true today. When you write letters um, and you write things, um, it stands out. It uh, it still holds value, as I say here. Twitter hasn't worked for me yet. I've tried contacting people that way, but not very successfully. So you could still, if you could find places in magazines to write opinion pieces to, uh, not too long ago, I did them for Southwest Magazine, um, the airlines, and uh, they included a piece, sent me some free stuff after. So that was kind of fun too. But then you always have something, like in this case, where I wrote about Scott Brocious, sent it to him and said, can you please sign it for me? So to Michelle, thank you for the kind words. So at the time, that was like the biggest thing in my life. Uh, another option you can have is if you have photos lying around, things like that, you could always send it to a celebrity, anyone. I'm a huge Billy Joel fan, especially as a kid. I think this was from when I was maybe 10 or 11. Send it to the person. Uh, just make sure that you have the return postage and packaging to for them to send it back, make it easy for them. And this just says to Amanda's, my sister and Michelle, Cheers, Billy Joel. So that's a fun one. And the best other uh, other way I can mention is just connections. Um, sometimes those connections lead you to taking some memorabilia home. Sometimes they're just other experiences. Um, the one on the left, I uh, have an uncle that works for American Airlines, and I got to do a first class uh, trip on a triple seven to London. And and it, it's not free, but it's greatly reduced in cost. 
And uh, it's just a matter of, you know, someone usually knows someone in the airlines and they could help you and they can get you on those planes. Or even if, and most of it is standby, but in the end, it's usually, it's worth it. Uh, top right, as many people can relate to with uh, George Bush and the Bush family. Um, that's someone that most people can usually find through one person, a connection. This is when I was, again, a lot younger. And I think this was in Florida at the time. She had the idea that, you know, just kind of reaching out. And when all else fails, you can go to Madame Two Sides and sit with whatever celebrity you'd like to. Um, I have lots more I could talk about, um, but I want to make sure I give Maria time. So if anyone has any questions, I can answer those now. All right. I will give it to Maria to continue. So thank you, Michelle. That was awesome. Um, I'm going to talk today about the differences between Stephen King's novel, The Shining, and the movie directed by Stanley Kubrick. So on the left-hand side of the screen there is a picture of the Timberline Lodge in Mount Hood, Oregon, which is the site of the exterior shots in the film. And on the right-hand side there you have the Stanley Hotel, which is in Estes Park and famously inspired Stephen King to write the novel. And before we enter the Overlook, this presentation is going to be, as I said, about Stephen King and Stanley Kubrick. There are several other adaptations, but not going into those at this time. Um, all of the opinions and conclusions made are my own. Some were sort of inspired by other people or agreed, I should say, agreed upon by other people. Um, and in where that's applicable, I'll mention that, but a lot of it is my own. Um, there's a lot more to say than I have time for today, but I'm always willing to talk about it. So <laughs> if you have any questions, definitely feel free. Um, and last of all, watch out for moving hedges, which we'll, I'll mention. Um, and steer clear of rooms 217 and 237. I'll talk about that as well. So let's start out in the lobby and get our bearings. So Stephen King wrote the book in 1977. It's his third novel and first hardcover bestseller. Kubrick's film came out in 1980. It was his 11th feature film. He co-wrote the screenplay with novelist Diane Johnson, Stephen King did write a screenplay that was not looked at by Stanley Kubrick. He said he felt that Stephen King was a weak writer and opted to write it himself, um, which led to a lot of changes, including changes in the way Stephen King um, allows adaptations of his work. He's now much more involved, and he famously did not like this one. Um, so that's a little bit of background information on both. When you're comparing and contrasting, I've found that you can kind of look at it as outside versus inside. So Stephen King looks at the motivations of his characters and the impetus for events as coming from outside sources, things outside the characters, where Stanley Kubrick looks at, he looks towards inside the characters to see how that informs them and the decisions they make um basically the luggage that they bring into the overlook he looks at that as being the cause of their behaviors and actions so i have a few a couple examples of how we can see that in both the book and movie first of all let's start off in the colorado lounge the bar in the overlook hotel at the top there I have Hyloid, which happens on page 350 of the novel. And it happens, uh, I would say, about two thirds of the way through the movie. That might not be exactly accurate. But at the bottom, you can see a classic scene lovingly remade by me. Um, so in the book, uh, well, in the book and the movie, um, both Jacks are recovering alcoholics, but it's used in different ways in each telling of the story. So Stephen King uses Jack's alcoholism to show how something from outside of him is what is 
directing his actions. So Jack Torrance in the novel is a tragic character. He's compared to characters like Prospero in Hamlet. And it's really seen as a descent into madness, Stephen King says. Um, and one of the main things that makes that possible is his addiction to alcohol. And so in his version, the alcohol itself comes from the Overlook. It just sort of like appears in the lounge as um, something that will get him to do what the hotel wants him to do. But on top of that, there are a couple moments that show that not only the alcohol itself, but the desire to have a drink comes from the hotel as well. So it's like an outside, outside force that's causing him to do what he does. Um, Kubrick's version leads a little bit more up to the viewer. Um, but regardless of the case, whatever your interpretation is, there's no doubt that terrible things have already happened before Jack even meets Lloyd or has a drink. Um, he has berated his wife and had those horrible dreams and um, he's well well into his classic 500 page all work and no play manuscript so it's clear that he's been going downhill for a while now and it kind of gets the viewer to ask was the alcohol necessary it surely helps but the question is would he have gone down that path anyway so it's much less of a tragic story than King's version. Next, let's take a quick look at the scenic overlook, the grounds of the hotel. So King's version has these giant hedge animals. You can see that picture is from the 1997 miniseries starring Stephen Weber. And Stephen King did write the teleplay for that one. So it is very, very close to the book. Um, Anyhow, these hedge animals are tasked with guarding the hotel, essentially. Um, they threaten and attack various characters throughout the book. And it's an example of something from the outside attacking the characters. They don't really, they don't have any control over the hedge animals. They're kind of victim to what they're going to do. Um, Kubrick, on the other hand, has a giant hedge maze outside of the Overlook. And there's lots of interpretations of the hedge maze. My, um, the one that resonates most with me is seeing it as a representation of Jack's mind. So you can see how the twisting, turning paths would replicate his thoughts. And the other part about a maze is that you are the one that's in control of the turns that you're making. So there is still some control coming from the inside of the character that's causing the events that's happening on the outside. Quite different from the um, evil hedge animals there. So here we go. Here's spoilers. There's some ending details ahead. I have one slide that has. Um, one image on it and then the next one after that is like a tan box with a bunch of arrows um when you see that one you can unmute but if you don't want to hear some details about the end of both you can mute yourself now or i guess we already are all muted so that's kind of um silly but okay so i have this poem here called Fire Nice by Robert Frost. It's one of my favorites. Um, I chose it for this slide because it shows the two different ways that the overlook ends in both King and Kubrick. So King has the hotel exploding, the boiler explodes, the whole thing ends in a big fire that takes Jack along with it. So in his case, yet again, there's another outside force, in this case the boiler, that is causing Jack to experience the things that he does. Um, he can control the boiler a little bit to a point, but once it gets to a certain level, there's nothing, it's, it's going to do what it's going to do. So that's 
just another example of an outside force. Kubrick has Jack wander out into the maze, which if we look at it as his own mind, he's getting lost in his own thoughts. He can't find his way out and he freezes there. So, and another important thing to note is that the Overlook survives in Kubrick's version and not in King's. So those are just a couple of different um, changes to the endings there, a couple of big changes. Um, and then in this last slide, spoilers are done. Um, I just have a couple of interesting little differences between the book and the movies that are always just a little bit fun to talk about. So the left side is the book, right side is the movie. First of all, we have Jack's weapon of choice, which in the book is a rope mallet. Rope is kind of a predecessor of croquet, so the mallet is a little bit, the handle is shorter, um, and that's what he uses to do his atrocities in the book. In the movie, he has that famous axe. In the book, Jack is working on a play called The Little School, and that's what he is working on throughout his time at the Overlook. And in the movie, he has that fantastic all work and no play, 500 page work there. In the book, there is a masquerade ball that several different characters see or sense throughout the book and a constantly repeated line is the word unmask. In the movie, there's that party that Jack sort of stumbles into from the 20s but doesn't have the masquerade element to it. In the book, a string of unrepeatable words becomes, here's Johnny, which was improvised by Jack Nicholson. In the book, room 217 is the room to avoid because of a particularly aggressive guest living there. In the movie that was changed to room 237 at the request of the Timberline Lodge, they felt that once guests learned that the hotel had been used in such a horror, scary movie, they would not want to stay in room 217, so they asked that it be changed to room 237 because there wasn't room 237. So they were avoiding all of those issues. Last of all, Grady's girls are mentioned twice in the book. They are, the, the, the incident is described at the beginning and then later in the end. Um, however, in the movie, we have those iconic twins that they're never actually seen by anyone in the book, just in the movie. So those are just some more little interesting facts. And we made it to the checkout desk. Um, I have a couple more resources here. Stephen King's sequel, Dr. Sleep, was written in, oh gosh, I don't know, a few years back. Um, it is the characters of The Shining uh, 25 years later. So it's not a direct sequel it takes place a while later and it's really good i liked it a lot um on the right side there is stephen king's the, the mini series that i mentioned from the 90s and on the bottom is a documentary called room 237 all about kubrick's movie so at the end here i have some work cited and that's the presentation i hope you enjoyed it i certainly loved talking about it <laughs>